Tonight, unions launch their campaign to bring down the Howard government. Honouring the legacy of murdered heart surgeon Victor Chang. And Pat Rafter off to a good start in his Wimbledon quarter-final. With Melissa Doyle, this is 7 News. Good evening. The union movement has launched its campaign to bring down the Howard government. The ACTU says it will target marginal seats during the federal election, with its influence likely to be felt in the upcoming Aston by-election. The ACTU says workers are doing it tougher now than they have for years. The union organisation says household debt is at a 30-year high. Interest payments on mortgage, credit card and personal loan debts have risen by nearly $100 a month per household. It blames the Howard government and the GST. It has hurt low-income households in this country in a very disproportionate way. The ACTU executive has decided on a marginal seats campaign at the next federal election. We'll hope to shift their votes so that we can uh, make sure that the Howard government doesn't have another term of office in which it can do even more damage to working Australia. You are the best Prime Minister in Australia we have ever seen. Australia needs you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Well, the government expects a protest from the ACTU, but it's hoping to minimise any protest vote at the Aston by-election on July 14. Mr Howard casts the Liberals in the role of underdog, and the party's own polling backs him up. It inspires me to work harder and uh, to remind people who don't want to... Uh, uh, deliver an undeserved bonus to Mr Beasley that they can't muck around with a protest vote. No party wants to go into an election as anything but the underdog. So it's no surprise that Labor is claiming the title too. It knows it needs a protest vote to get it over the line. Mr Beasley argues John Howard won't change his policies without one. One of the best ways of ensuring that he will is to give them another electoral rebuff in Aston. In Canberra, Jeff Parrott. Seven years. The bodies of 143 people have now been recovered from the wreckage of a crashed passenger plane in Siberia. No one survived the impact. Its cause is still unknown. The Tupolev 154 jet was travelling from Yekaterinburg in central Russia to Vladivostok in the country's west. On its third attempt to land for a regular fuel stop at the Siberian city of Okursk, something went wrong and the plane fell from the sky. From the beginning, Russian officials presumed the worst. In all likelihood, there are no survivors. We have no information to the contrary. According to preliminary reports, there was a fire on the ground. At airports thousands of kilometres away, friends and relatives learned the fate of their loved ones. The aircraft's flight recorders have been recovered and a commission established to determine the cause of the accident. Early reports suggest complete engine failure caused by a breakdown in the fuel transmission system. The Tupolev 154 is considered the workhorse of the region's airlines, responsible for half of all civilian flights in Russia and the former Soviet states. But it's far from reliable. Russia's answer to the 727 has been involved in 28 fatal crashes since its first flight in 1968. Phil Black, 7 News. Four people have been charged over the murder of Sydney Tavern manager Nigel Stiff. Two were arrested trying to fly out of the country. Police kept tabs on Y Kit Low or Ricky Low using telephone intercepts and listening devices. They then arrested him as he was about to step on board a Qantas flight to Manila. The investigation by members of Strike Force Tanara um, was an outstanding piece of investigative work. According to facts tendered in court, Ricky Lowe told police he was involved in the robbery in which Nigel Stiff was bashed, shot and stabbed to death. Police say Ricky Lowe was caught on video rehearsing the robbery on May 14. After that video was shown on TV, Ricky Lowe's brother, Wayman, rang to warn him he'd be recognised. Police facts say Ricky requested he dispose of a knife that was used in the offence. Man Lowe stated he gave him money which he was to use to leave the country. Ricky Lowe had already spent the proceeds of the robbery at Brisbane Casino. His brother and mother also face charges relating to the offence, as does family friend Karkan Chan. The court heard police are still seeking three other co-offenders in relation to the murder. The prosecution opposed bail for Ricky Lowe, saying investigations could be hampered if the alleged killer was freed.
Magistrate Bernard Kennedy remanded Lowe in custody until next week when all co-accused will reappear in court. Police are confident it won't be long until all Operation Tanaro's suspects are rounded up. And uh, you close to tracking them down? Well, yes, we are. Okay. Damien Smith, 7 News. Three men charged over the bodies in the Barrels murders have been ordered to stand trial. A magistrate today found they had a case to answer after one of South Australia's longest and most guarded committal hearings. The end of the preliminary hearing came quickly and almost as an anti-climax. After seven months of hearings and more than 3,000 pages of transcript, it was all over by midday. Prosecutor Wendy Abraham and lawyers for the three men put final submissions to the magistrate. But as has become common, almost everything they said was suppressed. But we can tell you that lawyer Mark Griffin, representing the accused John Bunting, and Stephen Apps, representing Robert Wagner, said little, except they did not concede the prosecution had established a case to answer. But John Lyons, representing Mark Hayden, made an impassioned submission that at best the evidence showed only that Hayden was merely an accessory after the fact to the murders of his wife Elizabeth and 18-year-old Fred Brooks. Referring to the other eight victims, Mr Lyons said there was not a scintilla, not a skerrick of evidence that Hayden had anything to do with their deaths. But Ms Abraham said the prosecution case was all about joint enterprise, the complicity of all three accused in various combinations in the murders of all ten victims. Magistrate Gurry found all three had a case to answer and ordered them to appear in the Supreme Court on August the 13th. But a trial may still be many months away. The lawyers have numerous other legal avenues still to be pursued. Jackie Drewer, 7 News. Two staff members at the Curtin Detention Centre in Western Australia claim they were threatened by an illegal immigrant with a weapon. Federal police are now investigating. Meanwhile, a detainee who incited a riot at the centre in April has been jailed for four years. 29-year-old Palestinian national Salah El Salah was convicted of a key role in the April riot which caused $250,000 damage. The court heard he just had his refugee application rejected and had nothing to lose. It was a very serious issue at Curtin when it occurred. Very considerable damage. 150 inmates went on the rampage, burning down buildings, smashing windows. Correction centre staff forced to use tear gas to control them. Salah El Salah denied he incited the riot or threatened to kill a guard. He'll now be jailed for four years, then deported. The magistrate praised guards at the detention centre, saying their actions saved lives and prevented serious injury. I have concerns about the safety of staff, and that's why I seek to ensure that they are appropriately trained. Gemma Tognini, 7 News. Former champion athlete Ron Clark has won a million dollar defamation case against the ABC. Mr Clark and his company sued the national broadcaster after the 7.30 report claimed his sports complex at Queensland's Runaway Bay was being built on a toxic waste dump. Mr Clark argued the report was malicious and caused him great distress. He said tests proved the site was not toxic but the program chose not to use the results in its report. A Melbourne court has heard the captain of a French cargo ship was so drunk he couldn't stand up when his vessel ran aground in Port Phillip Bay last week. When 58-year-old Yvonne Jean-Robert Flambeau <coughs> excuse me, was breath tested by Victorian police, he gave a reading of 0.29. The Mirand was refloated the following day using tugboats. Although Flambeau wasn't in charge at the time, he was found to be responsible and was fined $4,000. Well, the threat of a shark attack is stopping rescuers from rushing to the aid of a whale trapped by fishing nets in the Great Australian Bight. Conservationists say fishermen operating illegally inside a protected area are to blame. This is what's upsetting conservationists, a southern right whale in a marine park with debris from a commercial fishing boat dragging from its tail. The National okay. Parks and Wildlife Service and the Transport Department are trying to work out if the fishing tackle, which could include steel wire, can be safely cut free by rescuers in a boat. That shark worries me. Yeah, it does. Especially if the shark knows that this whale's on his last legs. You can't put a person in a boat in a water that remote 
with the shark there as well, and the, the, and the whale itself is extremely dangerous. National Park says the whale is not in any immediate danger, but conservationists say commercial fishing boats should not be allowed inside a marine park. We've had anecdotal reports over the years that the fishing industry has been in the park during the closed season. This is, I guess, proof that that's actually happening. With rough seas and 40 knot winds in the bite, it'll be impossible to get close to this stricken whale until later this week. A huge job which is logistically so difficult. I mean, we'll certainly do the best we can. Chris Warren, 7 News. Australia's political and social leaders have tonight gathered to remember pioneering surgeon Victor Chang, the man behind the country's first heart transplant. But 10 years after his murder, there are new concerns Australians are becoming complacent about the rising incidence of heart disease. A $500 a head dinner to mark the 10th anniversary of the death of Dr. Victor Chang. Business leaders were there, so too entertainers and political figures. A very great Australian and uh, a great example of the multicultural nature of our society. His own individual triumphs I don't think have been fully understood. The triumph over adversity, over environment, over the difficulties that Chinese Australians faced in this country. And one of Victor Chang's first transplant patients, a young girl from Tamworth, Fiona Coote, now so well known to Australians. The Prime Minister once formally declared Victor Chang the Australian of the century. Uh, tonight, um, as a nation, uh, we honour the memory of one of the greatest Australians of the 20th century. Dr Chang's family, proud of his achievements. Ten years ago, Victor Chang was left on a Sydney street, murdered by two kidnappers. Like so many I know around the country, I was gripped by a sense of, um, of despair and frustration and anger. Born in Shanghai, he pioneered cardiac research, setting up the heart transplant unit at Sydney St Vincent's Hospital. But the research institute created in his name says it's facing an increasing financial struggle. Australians generally are generous and that's why I find it hard to come to grips with that factor but I think it's a sort of it's a complacency a lack it's an inertia perhaps the most telling statistic is that the 128,500 people who die each year from heart related disease only 321 of those leave any money for medical research Chris Maher 7 News well stay with us on the late news next two men held over the murder of an Australian in Fiji and the plan to stop underage Australian fans seeing Eminem. Three airlines are to share the Western network of the failed flight West Airlines. Five airlines are involved in a bidding war for the routes, with $3.8 million in taxpayer subsidies up for grabs. Today, the destinations were split among Qantas, Ansett and Eastland Air. The Queensland Premier said he expects fares will remain the same and he wants the airlines to recruit sacked Flight West staff. So, this is about us picking up the pieces. Ansett already has come to the rescue of some Flight West staff. In other business news, former HIH Insurance Director Rodney Adler has applied to the Federal Court to suppress documents seized from his home. If successful, the move could limit the Australian Securities and Investments Commission's investigation into the company's collapse. Meanwhile, the UK operations of that other failed company linked to Rodney Adler have been sold. But as finance editor David Koch reports, Australian creditors of OneTel will only receive about a quarter of the money from the sale. The buyer, Centrica, predicts revenue for the operation during the last financial year will top $270 million. It's paying just under $160 million for the collapsed Telco's UK business. But after third-party debt and leasing arrangements are paid out, just $40 million will be left for Australian creditors. Good morning, ladies and As expected, the Reserve Bank has decided to leave official interest rates unchanged at 5%, which is 1.5% higher than those in America. After plenty of signs our economy is picking up, it didn't really come as a shock to market watchers, but they're not yet calling an end to the easing cycle, admitting more may need to be done to keep up the positive momentum. The global economy still represents major risks for Australia. That's still the big problem that we have. And domestically, unemployment is still likely to get worse before it gets better. That could also see another rate cut later in the year. 
Robbie Waterhouse is celebrating his return to the betting ring with a deal to float his wagering business. Made famous for the fine cotton scandal, Robbie, with Father Bill, owns a chain of betting shops in Fiji. It's proposed Waterhouse Bet Limited be sold to Adelaide Southern Equity Holdings, which is already listed. Along with another acquisition, it will then form the basis of a major Asian online wagering and gaming business. Banking telco and resource stocks fell today, taking the rest of the market with them. The All Lords down 18 points, the ASX 200 lost 20. AMP shed 65 cents, BHP Billiton provided a little bit of light amid all the gloom, climbing 13 cents, Telstra lost 4. Our dollars are creeping towards 51.9 US cents, it buys 61 euro and just under 37 pence. Gold is trading at 267 US dollars an ounce. For more business and finance news, visit i7news.com.au and follow the links to David Kosh. Have a good night. Police in Fiji have detained two men over the murder of Red Cross Chief John Scott. One suspect was recently kicked out of the police force. It's alleged he was having an affair with Mr Scott's partner, Greg Scrivener. The mutilated bodies of Mr Scott and Mr Scrivener were found early on Sunday. A rare disease is killing kangaroos at a zoo in Ohio. Five roos and three wallabies have died of toxoplasmosis. The disease is caused by a parasite carried by cats. Zoo officials believe strays may have contaminated it's hay. No matter what we do, they go ahead and, uh, and die. The exhibit's closed while vets keep a close eye on the survivors. Children may be banned from Eminem's Sydney concerts. The controversial rap artist is due to perform at the city's Superdome later this month. But critics are demanding the immigration minister block his visa application. If Eminem is allowed in Australia, the New South Wales government may restrict his performances to those aged over 18. I find his lyrics offensive. I find them very unacceptable. But I think that he shouldn't be banned on that basis. Women's groups and religious leaders say Eminem is a preacher of hate. Well, Queenslanders continue to revel in their rugby league state of origin win. Their state flag is now flying on top of Sydney's Harbour Bridge. New South Wales Premier Bob Carr bet his Queensland counterpart Peter Beatty that the loser would fly the winner's flag for a day. So at dawn, down came the New South Wales flag and up went Queensland's banner. It'll be gone tomorrow. Well, sport is next, including Pat Rafter's Wimbledon clash with Thomas Enquist. Then Shane Warne, determined to go out in style. The Wallabies have made changes for Saturday's second test against the British and Irish Lions in Melbourne. Matt Burke returns as fullback, replacing Chris Latham. Rod Moore comes in for the injured Glenn Panaho. And Michael Foley replaces Jeremy Paul at hooker with Brendan Cannon on the bench. The Australians are full of confidence ahead of tomorrow's first Ashes test. While England struggles with injuries, the tourists say they're fighting fit. It's widely regarded as the best bowling attack to leave Australia's shores. McGrath, Lee, Gillespie and of course Shane Warne. It's a lethal combination. I don't think um, we've ever played together in a, in a test match so if it's not the best it's in the grand final I would presume. It was in 1993 Warne announced his arrival in England with that delivery. And he's done it. Eight colourful years on, our greatest wicket-taker is on probably his last Ashes tour and he wants to go out in style. If it is my last tour here, then I'd like to make it one to remember. Meanwhile, Ricky Ponting is getting set for a new challenge, a move back up the order to number three, where he enjoyed only moderate success early in his career. No problems this time. He says he's in the best form of his life. Well, I'd like to come off the ground and get straight into the batting gear and get ready to go out to bat, so... Yeah, it's going to be a good challenge and something I'm looking forward to. And while the Australians are at full strength and brimming with confidence, England has been devastated by injury. Thorpe, Vaughan and Ramprakash out. And Ashley Giles has tonsillitis. In Birmingham, Nick McArdle, 7 News. Well, Pat Rafter is through to the semi-finals of Wimbledon. Rafter ousted Sweden's Thomas Enquist in four sets. And in the other men's quarter-final, Goran Ivanisevic is up by two sets to one against Marit Safin.
Pat Rafter had beaten Thomas Enquist in six of their previous eight meetings, and the Australian had never lost to his opponent on grass. Enquist's form was hard to fault, one of only two players not to have dropped a set in the tournament. Rafter began well, snaring the early break for a three-love lead. Yes, what a great forehand off the smash. The Swede couldn't do anything right. Stumbling to defeat in the opening set, Rafter broke again and took it six games to one in 21 minutes. With the first set out of his mind, Enquist began to find form. His serve in particular doing the damage. Despite an Enquist form reversal, Rafter came out of it unscathed to break in the seventh game of the second set. Well played. The two sets to love lead was to follow, and the third seeded Australian was eyeing a spot in the semi finals. Heading into the third set, Rafter had only come up with one unforced error, and with volleying like this, it was easy to see why. Enquist hadn't given up hope and broke the Rafter serve to lead 3 1. That is a super passing. Rafter's net play was at its best. The third seed broke back in a tense third set. Christian Jansen, 7 years. How good is that? All right, now let's check the weather conditions right around the country. The satellite shows some scattered rain clouds over much of the Tasman, but apart from low cloud around the southwest coast and in the far north, skies are looking clear. A high over the southeast is fading as a cold change moves into the eastern bight, while a strong high is building up over southern western Australia. Around the capitals, fine in Brisbane, becoming fine in Sydney with a top of 18, rain developing in Melbourne, mainly fine in Hobart, showers and windy conditions in Adelaide, fine in Perth, Darwin and the Alice. And that is all from the 7 Newsroom tonight. We'll have more on Sunrise at 6am. I'm Melissa Doyle. Good morning.